Well, we're in the second week of a new series, and um, last week we kind of covered the thing about how the, the magnet of the church, you know, sometimes the church kind of struggles, and the church in America is struggling a little bit right now, and, and uh, it's just drawing us back to the point that how we treat each other, how Christians treat each other, the whole idea of being a community together, and the early church was a magnet and people were drawn to the early church because they had such love for each other. And so I um, read the, the scripture from John 13, 34 to 35. I want to read that again. Jesus, and this is when he's in the upper room, he says, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another love one another and this he's telling this to the church he's not telling us uh, just to love the world he's telling us to first and foremost love each other and then you know after we love each other we are to love our neighbors and then we're to love our enemies but you, you can't love your enemies if you don't love the brother and the sister first so this is just very important and and love is his commandment and jesus promises that if we love people that people will know that we are his followers and Today we come to our second in the one another's, and uh, all these commandments kind of follow the first one of love one another, and, and today the one is accept one another. And uh, there's a couple places we could take this. I've taken it from Romans 15, 7. And he says, therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Now, Paul's saying this to the church. He's not telling this to everybody. He's telling this to Christians. And it's not, not spoken to the world, but to the church. And it's kind of similar to this first commandment that we had that Jesus gave. And that, ex that example there was to be Jesus. He says, you love each other the way that I loved you. And here he says, you accept each other in the same way that I accepted you. And we are to love the way that Jesus loved. And we are to accept the way that that uh, Christ accepted us and and. and his acceptance is kind of the gold standard. This is the example. This is how we know what love is and what acceptance is. Now, before we go any further, I want to just kind of clear up what might be a misconception for us uh, on the word accept. Um, we, we hear that word, and I don't know about you, but I kind of think of, okay, if I'm supposed to accept somebody, that means I'm supposed to approve of them. All right, And, and I, I'm supposed to agree with them. And that, that's not what's meant here. That's not, that's not what he's saying. Um, a lot of the other translations, instead of using the word accept, use the word welcome. And, and see, here it is, Romans 15, 7 in the ESV version. He says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And when he uses this word accept um, and welcome, what it really means is to receive someone or to accept someone, or to have someone else as a guest, is, is what he's talking about. And the principle is hospitality. The practice of, of accepting and wel welcoming a person that you do not know. It, it's a commandment. It's, it's a mark of the early church. It's an act of faith. And we accept another person. We receive them. We welcome someone. And we do that without them earning it. We don't, we don't receive them because we like them so well or because they've done something for us. We just receive them because it's a commandment of God. It's kind of extending grace to someone is what we're doing. When, when I was a kid in, in rural Illinois, uh, we had what was called hobos. I don't know if you guys had any of those. Probably you're all too young for this, but... Uh, you know, today we'd call them homeless people, and that's really what they were, but um, they rode the rails. And we lived on a farm, you know, and there was a railroad that was about a quarter of a mile from our house, and we were the closest house to this, you know, rail for a while. And uh, oftentimes there'd be a man that would get off the train and walk up the quarter mile road to our house, knock on the back door, and ask if we had any food. And we called them hobos. Not, not really a good term. Don't go calling somebody that, but that, 
that was the thing. It's kind of a derogatory term, you know. I don't think we got any hobos here, do we? I, I, don't, I hope I haven't insulted anyone. But anyway, uh, my mom would go in and, and fix a meal and take it out to him. And, and sometimes they'd say, can I spend the night in the barn? And they would let him spend the night in the hayloft. But he would, uh, you know, they sit out there. She'd fix a meal for him. He'd sit out there on the back porch. And I remember as a little kid looking at the screen and just thinking, I wonder where this guy comes from. I don't know him. He's a stranger. Didn't see very many strangers back then. It was just kind of mystical, exciting kind of thing, you know. And, uh, you know, that's what happened. But <clears throat> my mom's hospitality for him was kind of marginal because she only partially received him. Uh, it's just to the back porch, right? You're not going to come in the house. And I'm, I'm sure my dad told her, you don't let men in the house when there's, you're alone. We don't know who they are, and that'd be kind of silly. And I'm, I'm not making a judgment on that one way or the other, but you know that was kind of the way that it was done, and she was a little afraid. So there's still kind of a barrier there. And, you know, I'm, I'm just pointing that out. I'm not criticizing my mom. I think she's probably pretty wise for doing it that way. But maybe she made her, he made her feel just a little uncomfortable, probably. You know, I, I would guess. You know, you don't know who this guy is. But I remind us here that, that Paul is not speaking to the world, but he's speaking to the church. This is the commandment to one another. He's speaking to the church, and he's telling us, how to be the people of God and describing what that looks for us and what is it that sets us apart from other people? How do Christians look different? And he says, you know, they have hospitality. They welcome other people in. They're, they're, they're kind to strangers. And again, before we can welcome in our neighbors, which is what Jesus said to do, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, and before we can love our enemies or welcome in our enemies, you have to at least be able to welcome in people in the church and other people that are in the family of God. Now, hospitality was a, a Hebrew practice uh, before it was a Christian practice. Hospitality is very important in Bible times. You remember that Abraham saw three strangers coming, and he told Sarah, come on, you know, we need to go kill a calf and bake some bread and we need to fix a meal. And they had him into his tent. And we learned later that one of them is the Lord and the other two are angels. But Abraham just showed what was natural at that time was to show hospitality to people. And uh, later on in the book of Hebrews, it says in Hebrews 13, it says, don't neglect to show hospitality to strangers for in doing so, you have entertained angels or messengers. And so, more likely looking back to what Abraham had done, and, and I don't know if you've ever entertained people like that before, but when uh, I meet a stranger and I show him hospitality, I always try to kind of get my ears up, so to speak, because so, he might be giving me a message. It might not literally be an angel, but God might be using this person to give me a message. So I'm always kind of wondering what, you know, this chance encounter that I've got with this person, what, what might God be wanting to tell me through them? But back then it was unthinkable to let a stranger come by your place and not give them lodging in the Old Testament, not give them lodging and, and give them food. Absolutely unthinkable. I mean, this was a huge insult and you would be marked as a very bad person if you didn't welcome the stranger in. Even today in the Middle East, the Bedouin that are still there, I mean, there's still people that have flocks like they did 2,000 years ago, and they, they, they roam the countrysides. And I understand that, that the, the common greeting for someone when a stranger comes is to say, you are among your family. So here somebody's coming by, and if you, you're among your family. In other words, our family is your family because you're a stranger. But, but hospitality was specifically commanded by God. Leviticus 19.34 is just one place. Uh, he says, You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Anytime they said, I am the Lord your God, attached on it, this is a commandment. I'm saying this to you. And you're to treat strangers kind with kindness. Welcome them in because your ancestors were strangers, see, in, down in Egypt. 
The reason is the same one that's kind of given by Paul. Receive others the way that you have been received. See, you were once alone and without God in this world is what Paul tells us. We were all strangers. That's in Ephesians 2.12. And last week, remember, we ended the, the, the sermon talking about 1 Peter 4.8, where it says that love covers over a multitude of sins and how we in the body of Christ are to cover over each other's sins. We, we, are, we are to cover them, not expose each other's sins. And the very next verse in here, Peter says, practice hospitality to each other without complaint. So we're to extend grace in the body of Christ. One of those qualifications, even of a bishop, was, well, you have to be wise, you have to have knowledge, you have to be able to teach. Oh, and you have to have hospitality for a bishop in the early church. Seems like a very menial thing to be somebody that welcomes in strangers, but it's a sign that you understand God's grace that's been extended to us because you have been a stranger and God has welcomed you in. When Jesus sent out his followers two by two and then by the 72, first he sent out 12 two by two, and then he sent out 72, two by two. He told them, he says, you know, don't, don't pack a bag. You don't need to take money with you. Just go, and if there's a house that receives you in, that's a place of peace, go and stay there. Enjoy their hospitality. Now, wouldn't that be strange today if we sent missionaries out that way? You know, now we send missionaries out, and they have to raise their funding and get everything together, so when they go into this foreign land, they've got enough money to live. Wouldn't it be weird if we just told them, no, you just, just go down there to Liberia, and just you'll, you'll, you'll find people there to welcome you in, and you just eat their food and live with them. That's the way Jesus did it, because he knew they would be taken in, because people practice hospitality. Vital to the kingdom of God. In fact, when asked about who's going to inherit the kingdom of God, Jesus lists hospitality, those who welcome strangers in. Did you know that? It's in that section which is called the great white throne judgment when he returns and, and he divides the people on his left and his right and the ones on his right go to Reward and the one that's on his left go to eternal punishment. One of the decisions that he makes as to whether we go to his right or his left, it says, as, as we've done to the least of these. It's, it's there in Matthew 25, 36. He says, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. This is how serious this is. We think it's just being friendly. See, no. This is extending God's grace to someone else. Accepting one another, welcoming one another is not an option. But if it's missing, it means in essence that we are rejecting Christ. God says, welcome one another, accept one another, just like Christ has accepted you. I don't know about you, but, but he has fully welcomed me. Uh, I had nothing to offer. I wasn't bringing him anything. Um, Jesus didn't say, well, Don, I really need you in my church because, you know, you're just so great and wonderful. It, I really need you, Don. I didn't have anything. You didn't have anything to offer him. What are you going to give to Jesus that he doesn't have? Huh? See, I was a stranger. I, I, didn't, I didn't have anything that was going to make things better. I, you know, I was the least, but he extended grace to me. When I came to him, I was thirsty. I was tired. I was empty. I had nothing to give God but just, you know, a bag of failures. It was all we have. To give him but he welcomed me in I was among the least but he welcomed me into his family he probably had the same kind of experience and God calls us to welcome others as he has welcomed us now long before the church had pulpits and and classrooms the pulpit had kitchens and dinner tables even as a casual reading in the New Testament we find that the church was not housed in sanctuaries but the church was housed in homes the primary gathering place of the church was the home. They took their meals, it said, house by house. 
They worshiped together in the houses. They, they, they prayed together. They gathered there. And I mean, this is just so genius of God to do it this way. The first generation of Christians was kind of a, a tinderbox of contrasting cultures and backgrounds. On the day of Pentecost, there in Acts, Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit first fell on them, we can count at least 15 different kinds of cultures represented there. And we think we're living in a diverse society, nothing like what they had. Theirs is much more diverse than what ours is today. And Jesus stood next to Gentiles. We, we can't imagine, or excuse me, Jews were, were put with Gentiles. And, and that, that gulf between the Jew and the Gentile, we just can't imagine that. You know, if you were a Jew before you became a Christian, if you were a Jew, you would not do business with somebody that wasn't a Jew, a Gentile. And if you were a Jew, it meant that you were definitely not to eat with them, to break bread with them. It was just forbidden. You didn't speak to them. You, you didn't have anything to do with them. But then suddenly in Christ, now they're together. Now we have Jews and Gentiles together. And how are they going to do that? And this, they have this wall of hostility that has been there through the centuries. And, and Paul says that Jesus tore the wall down, the barrier that's between these cultures. And now they're thrust into the church together. As they died to their old lives and they were born again in Christ, there's a new family. And so what we have is Jews and Gentiles worshiping together and men and women worshiping together and slaves and masters in the same church. And can people with such a varied background be together with each other? It's difficult. It's really difficult. But they did it. They were old barriers. God just kept insisting that they were all one in Christ, that the old was gone. That's why he insisted and commanded that for us to be the church, for us to be the family, for us to be his body, his temple, that we accept and welcome strangers and other people. We wonder if the church can really get past our divisions sometimes. I mean, how, how can Hispanics live in peace with Anglos? It's not easy some days. Can Democrats find some common ground with Republicans? Hmm. We'll find out after November, won't we? <laughs> Till then, probably. Can cats live around the cards? See, we have some divisions, don't we? Can divergent people really get along? Early church did. Without the aid of sanctuaries or church buildings or clergy or seminaries, they did so through the clearest of messages the cross of Jesus Christ has brought down the barrier. He has made a new people. We are one. Everyone can practice hospitality, you know. Not everyone can go to serve in a foreign land. Not everyone can be a teacher, but everyone can practice hospitality. There was a story told uh, by, by Daniel Meyer of an older woman who was, had heard a message probably such like this and looking for ways for God to use her. And she was getting up in years, and she didn't have a lot of money. She lived alone in an apartment close to a college. And so she got this idea, and she thought about the needs of the people around her, and she started, God started tugging on her heart. And so she had this idea, kind of strange, but kind of simple. She got some little cards and three by five cards and she wrote on each one she said are you homesick come to my house at four o'clock for tea well as you can guess she didn't get a whole lot of kids that came it was kind of a slow start come to my house for tea but it started growing and growing and 10 years later when this lady passed 80 80 honorary pallbearers, college kids that had been to her house for tea because they were homesick. Just simple hospitality. Just simple, you're, you're a stranger here, but I'd like to welcome you in. It's not that hard. Everybody can do this. So how do we do this? What, what's stopping Christians from accepting each other? I, I think of two things. I know there are more than this, but just two today. Sometimes it's just old-fashioned superiority attitudes. We just 
think that we're more than what we are. We think we're better. If you find yourself saying or thinking, and that person's not going to fit in here, then you're probably an elitist. If, if you think your Christian group or your club or your church is for these kind of people, you're probably an elitist. And elitists suffer from a lack of knowledge. Knowledge about themselves. Because they think they're more than what they are. That's just simple as we can put it. That's what Paul told the Romans in 12.3. He warned them, don't think more highly of yourself than you should. Kind of a nice way of saying, you ain't all that. Right? <laughs> and that's what we elitists suffer from when we act that way. The second thing I think of is fear. You know, fear of the unknown in other people. Through the years, I have watched, you know, I've been a pastor for over 25 years, and, and through the years, I have watched as uh, new people come to a church, and I watch how the church, and the other churches I pastored, been a little bit bigger than this, but how, how, they, how they welcome these people. And uh, usually about 20% of the church, you take a traditional church, you know, got a couple, 300 people in it. Usually about 20% of the people come up and, and greet someone. And when I bring it to their attention that they did not act with hospitality towards this stranger, then people said, well, I didn't know him. That's what somebody always says. I, I didn't know him. I'm like, duh. Why would you know a stranger? <laughs> but that's what people say. I, I didn't know him, you know. Or they'll say, I didn't know what to say. Well, how about, hi, I'm Don. I don't think I know you. Isn't that simple? Hi, I'm Don. I don't think I know you. It just, just solves that right there. Hospitality takes a little bit of faith. And, you know, when, when we have fear, a fear that I don't know the right thing to say or, you know, I'm going to make him feel uncomfortable or one of these other fears, we're not acting in faith. We're acting in fear, Right? And so it's just going to take a little bit of faith. Now, we have a motto. Um, you've all seen it. When you, when you come up the steps, it's on that banner that's on the, on the table out there. It says, the stranger is the priority. I thought of that years ago. I thought, you know, I've never seen that. I, I kind of like that. I, 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 that. That came from here. I didn't, I didn't steal that. You know, every <laughs> once in a while, I have a thought. I thought, that's a neat thing. The stranger is a priority. And I shared that with a, a couple pastor friends, and they said, yeah, I wouldn't do that. That's not... Mm. Said, the, the, people, the people, you know, your, your old timers, the people been there for a while, they're not going to like that. They're, they're going to think that the strangers are more important than they are. Said, Bingo. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that the way it goes? Isn't that the way it is? Now, nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in this story does it say that we work ourselves up to privilege with God. And the church functions the same way. We don't work ourselves up in the church to a point of privilege. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, I came for the least of these. He says, it's not the well people that need the physician, it's the sick people, right? He says, that's who I came for. And so sometimes we get that kind of mixed up, and I'm, I'm hanging mine on the, the stranger is the priority, period, because to Jesus, the stranger was the priority. And when we refuse to accept others, we're rejecting him. And the Spirit is not in us, for if we knew him, we would not reject them. Now, don't misunderstand me here. I, I'm probably saying this a little late in the message, but... Um, I'm not saying that anyone can do anything and that's just fine because we accept people and we welcome people. Always in tension with hospitality is the holiness of the church. You have to understand this. God calls the church to be a holy place. And he doesn't say, so you can just come and you can just continue doing all those things that you used to do, you know, and it's okay here because we accept you the way you are. You just keep on doing all that stuff. It's not the way it goes, and that's not what I'm saying. So, so please don't misunderstand me. Paul had many lists that he gave the church. He says, don't do these things. Stop doing these things. He says, you're, you're not in the body 
if you're doing these things. And, and just one of them here in 1 Corinthians 6. I'm not going to read the things, okay, because you think I'm picking on you if I read the things. So I'm not going to read the things, but you can go home and read them for yourself. But after he says that, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, he says, And this is what some of you used to be, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Used to be. <laughs> but you were washed, okay? You were sanctified, you were justified, okay? Okay? Accepting the stranger does not mean that they can do anything anymore. It means that they will not remain a stranger. There, there are behaviors that threaten the community of faith. So I'm not saying anything goes. What, what I am saying is that the doors are open for all to come in and to be washed and sanctified and justified. And, and we're not going to have a sorting process when it comes to extending God's grace to the stranger. We're not going to sort that. And before we can welcome our neighbors and our enemies, remember, as Jesus tells us, we have to first welcome our brothers and our sisters in Christ. Now I want to close with the story. I don't know if you've heard this or not. Some of you are old enough to remember Jim Baker. Jim Baker used to be the head, Jim and Tammy Baker, used to be the head of the PTL network, okay? And they were wild and... And, uh, oh, my, he fell from grace, didn't he? Yeah. He, he did some terrible things, and he was put in jail. And, and uh, about half the Christian community really enjoyed that, and, and the other half didn't. But uh, he had a story, and I, I want to read this to you. He says, when I was transferred to my last prison, Franklin Graham said he wanted to help me out when I got out with a job, a house to live in, and a car. And it was my fifth Christmas in, in prison. I thought it over and said, Franklin, you can't do this. It will hurt you. The Grams don't need my baggage. He looked at me and he said, Jim, you were my friend in the past. You're my friend now. If anyone doesn't like it, I'm looking for a fight. So when I got out of prison, the Grams sponsored me and paid for a house for me to live in and gave me a car to drive. And the first Sunday out, Ruth Graham called the halfway house I was living in at the Salvation Army and asked permission for me to go to Montreat Presbyterian Church with her that Sunday morning. So when I got there, the pastor welcomed me and sat me with the Graham family. There were like two whole rows of, rows of them. I think every Graham, aunt, uncle, and cousin was there. The organ began playing and the place was full except for a seat next to me. Then the doors opened and in walked Ruth Graham. And she walked down that aisle. She sat next to inmate 07407-058. And I had only been out of prison 48 hours, but she told the world that morning that Jim Baker was her friend. It's a good story. Ruth Graham did it the way that Jesus would do it, didn't she? Yeah. Jesus had evidently welcomed her and to the fold, and she remembered that. And so she welcomed Jim Baker, one of the stray sheep, back into the fold. Accept one another like Christ accepted you. Boy, that's a high standard. What a gold standard that is. For us to extend our hand to someone else the same way that Christ reached out for us standard that says invite that person in that person needs christ you be my hand today you be the one that sits by him you be the one that welcomes him in now let's let's pray through that for a minute Be 
washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out